you and I are a lot alike when it comes down to interviews because what we look for and what you look for as an author and what I look for as an interviewer are fascinating stories, interesting stories to dig in a little bit into the individual and find out more about them that might not be so publicly known. It's, it's part of our job to dig and dig respectfully. Sometimes it's not very respectful. People get a little unhappy with us when we dig for information. And out of all of these athletes that you've spoken with over the years, which one called you on the phone? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> out of all those athletes that you've talked to, see, even uh, Gene Marola, my friend, the comedian, he goes, I'm going to steal that line. Um, out of all these guys and athletes you've talked to, which one, can you pick one that you asked a question of and hit you with an answer that even you, you had to, kind of lean back a little in your chair and go, that I did not expect. Uh, absolutely. And that was Mickey Mantle. I went to see Mickey. It was funny. This was for my book, Dynasty. And uh, Mickey had agreed to see me in his home uh, in Dallas. So I flew to Dallas and I called from the airport to speak to him. And his wife picked up the phone and said, Mickey's in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to stay overnight, catch the next plane to New York, where I met him in uh, the Yankees uh, uh, clubhouse. And he knew he knew I was coming, though it was funny. I, 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 I was too in awe to go up to him. So I asked Ellie Howard, Ellie, would you please introduce me to Mickey? And he said, sure. So, so Ellie introduced the two of us, and I said, "Mickey, uh, can I can I talk to you for a few minutes?" And Mickey, that imp that he is, looked at me with a straight face, and he went, "No." <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, he smiled, and and we talked, and and he was, I I just loved the guy. He he was unbelievably honest. So this was in 1973. And he had retired in 1968. And I asked him about what it was like to be no longer a player. And he began to tell me about the nightmares that he had, where he would be lying in bed in the middle of the night. And he could hear the PR announcer announcing, now batting in the third position, number seven, Mickey Mantle. And he would be standing outside Yankee Stadium and he would not be able to find the door to get into the stadium. And he told me that he would wake up in a cold sweat. I was just, just floored by that. When you got a chance to talk to him further, did he... Did he ever did he ever warm up? I mean to where he was at that Midwestern kid. Or was he always on guard? Because I understand Mickey was always on guard when he was around everybody. Well, it's funny. Um, you know, Michael Burke, who was the president of the Yankees at the time, had written a letter for me to the ball players. So when I spoke to Mickey, he, he was not on guard at all. I mean, maybe that's why. Maybe it's my scintillating personality. I don't know. Uh, but but he was very, very open with me, very warm. Um, it seemed like he was happy to have me talk to him when we were talking. And he was, he was absolutely fabulous. He really was. Um, the, the other one who, who really struck me was Roger Maris. Um, Roger had not been treated well the last few years of his days as a Yankee. Uh, Roger was a very, very private guy. Uh, I had written to him, got no answer. I went to Gainesville to his beer distributorship. He wasn't there. Um, so basically I had the feeling that, you know, uh, you know, maybe Roger was going to stiff me. You know, the only one who ever stiffed me was Joe DiMaggio. And he stiffed me. <laughs> For whatever and reason, I'm not surprised. Yeah, right. And and he stiffed me because he stiffed everybody. Yes. Because he was always so afraid that somebody would ask him about Marilyn Monroe. Um, 
Which but is fair. With Roger, with Roger, I don't know. I wasn't having any success. So, so I, I was down in Atlanta where I was interviewing Cleet Boyer. And Cleet, who was a lovely guy, he, he, he had a bar. And he said the Golden Glove was his bar. And Cleet said to me, um, I'll meet you at 9 o'clock in the morning at my bar. So I drove there, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, I ordered a root beer, and I sat at the bar, and I sat at the bar, and sat at the bar until 9 o'clock at night when Cleet walked in with Roger Maris. <laughs> and it was amazing. It was just amazing to me. And so uh, Roger and I sat down at a table. Cleet said, excuse me, uh, you know, I got a few things that I got to do. So Roger and I are sitting across from each other, and I didn't want to say to Roger, can I talk to you? Because I was afraid that if he said no, that it would ruin our night. So basically, you know, I mean, what do you say to Roger Maris? You know, how have you been? How you doing? I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable. And Roger saw that, and he said to me, let's go outside and we can talk. And we did. Um, and he's one of the interviews in this Whispers of the Gods book. Uh, he was, again, incredibly open um, about what had happened to him. Uh, Ralph Houck uh, was the general manager, and in uh, one of the years, uh, 66, I believe it was, he had slid into home plate and caught his hand on the umpire's cleats and broken his hand. And the Yankees took x-rays of his hand, um, but they never told him his hand was broken. They needed him to play because um, the Yankees were in free fall and they needed his celebrity to draw fans. Uh, and so they never told him his hand was broken. And the other thing, of course, with Roger is that when he told Hauk that he was going to retire, Hauk said to him, please don't do it now wait until the spring and we can have uh, a day for you. And so Roger went, yeah, okay, I can do that. And about a week later, the Yankees traded Roger to the St. Louis Cardinals. Oh. And Roger didn't want to quit then because he had a feeling that now the Cardinals fans were going to say, oh, that Roger Maris, you know, look at that guy. So Roger played two more years and helped lead the Cardinals to penance in 1967 and 1968. The guy was, I don't know why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Spectacular, spectacular uh, ball player. His only problem was that he didn't get along with the, with the press. Quite frankly, here in 2021, I don't have a problem with that because a lot of the press that's out there doesn't deserve the respect of anybody getting along with them. 